this week in Pure Reinvention. When you talk about diversity and inclusion, diversity is really just the noun, but the inclusion is the actual verb. Episode 103, Nikki Pardo, owner, Global Alliance Solutions. Engage, disrupt, adapt, repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Welcome to this episode of Pure Reinvention, where we create space for the unexpected by inspiring a reinvention lifestyle. I'd like to welcome our co-host again, Julie Novak, Chief Executive Officer of the Michigan State Medical Society. Thank you for your time, Julie. Thanks, Mike. I really was inspired by the conversation that Nikki shared about diversity and inclusion. You know, I probably might never have bumped into her on the street or in the normal course of events, but having the opportunity to hear her story and how she's used her experience and her skills to do good and to help the world move in the right direction and to help companies do the right thing, uh, I'm glad I heard that story. It is amazing to me how we think about words and we use, we use words like diversity or we use words like inclusion um, and say we are. We, we know what they are, therefore we must be doing them. When Nikki is teaching us that uh, perhaps those words are not nouns, but they're verbs. Right. She talks about one being a noun and one being a verb. And the way she articulated it, I think, is helpful. They're words we're hearing a lot, but we, don't, we think we know what they mean, but sometimes we don't really think through the meaning in a practical way. And she gives us a very practical descri- description of what those are. Those are great things to listen for, so let's listen now. This week's episode is sponsored by HRM Services, providing solutions that work. HRMS provides customized human resource consulting services to fit the unique needs of their clients. Every client has a story, and they make it their business to learn yours. Contact HRM Services today at 517-974-8033 or visit their website at hrmservices.biz. Of the five steps in the pure reinvention process, which step do you most closely associate yourself with? I would say being a disruptor because dealing with diversity and inclusion and civil rights laws. Yeah, so to go into these companies and to talk about where they're vulnerable can kind of be disruptive (laughs) and make them feel uncomfortable but it's all for the greater good but initially that is that can be deemed as very disruptive and Nikki what is your superpower that is my superpower the ability to go into companies and determine where they are vulnerable from a management perspective and also staff so I would say I throw my cape on and those are my superpowers Nikki um All of us have some vulnerability, and all of us have those certain areas where we are uncomfortable at times. So can you explain to us a time just recently where you might have found yourself in an uncomfortable situation? Yeah, recently, um, well, my passion, of course, is training. And my trainings are highly interactive. It's not lecture-based where I'm just standing there talking about, oh, diversity is so wonderful. So I was tapped on the shoulder to be a keynote in Birmingham, Alabama. And that had me kind of step out of my comfort zone. At first I was reluctant to take the contract. And then I said, you know what, I can do this. And I was talking about women in leadership or lack thereof. And so that that was me really kind of stepping out of my comfort zone. I was a nervous wreck. I am woman enough to admit that, (laughs) that I was so nervous, but I got through it and we all had a blast. And I'll bet it was a home run. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The feedback was very positive. Yep. So tell us a little bit about Global Alliance Solutions and how you came to have uh, your own company. Well, I was fortunate enough to work for the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, and I worked there for almost 10 years and hit the glass ceiling. It was the smallest state department. It is currently the smallest state department. I mean, people literally would retire or pass away in, in management positions. So I looked around and I said, there's got to be more than this. So I left and... Um, on very good terms. Matter of fact, they threw a huge party for me and ended up working for a company that allegedly or perceivably uh, discriminated against me based on my age and my race. So, and I say allegedly because we did settle. And so after that, I walked out of the federal building and I'm like, okay, I don't have a job. (laughs) So 
For my MBA, I wrote a just a fictitious diversity training and consulting company. And I took it off the shelf and started breathing life into it. And so here I am. It's been a fantastic journey. I've gotten a lot of good feedback. And yeah, things are going really well. So to, to answer your question as far as what we do, we educate employers on ways to prevent discrimination-related lawsuits or grievances or EEOC charges. So, and I separate staff and management. So what I say to staff could be viewed as rebel rousing. So what I say to management, talk about laws and things like that. Nikki, why do we struggle so much with this word called diversity? I think because it's so layered, and I think diversity is synonymous with race even though there's so many layers to it, you know, you have diversity. And Mike, and you, and you and I had this conversation when we first met about there's so much more to it. When you unpack it, it's diversity of thought, it's diversity of experiences. It could be Republican versus Democrat. It could be a redhead versus brunette. So I think it, it's, like I said, it's become synonymous with race. And anytime you talk about race, I mean, people have gotten jailed. People have gotten killed over this topic. So I think that is why people, and it's human nature, to, to why people kind of shy away or reluctant to talk about diversity. Sure. Yet, executives, mm -hmm. successful executives, realize that when you can embrace diversity, yes. you have a whole different outcome, right? Yes. So talk about, really, I think your real training is in how you embrace diversity and how you use it as a wonderful tool for success. Right, right. You hit the nail right on the head, Mike, because I preface in my trainings that when you talk about diversity and inclusion, diversity is really just the noun, but the inclusion is the actual verb, and that is when people are coming together and breaking up that group think. And again, let's go back to human nature. It is human nature to hire people who are like you, who are like-minded. But you're going to have the exact same outcome. And, and I saw this actually come to fruition back in my glory days at the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, where we were an employment unit. We were broken up into several groups. And they, there's a science to it. They were brilliant at coming up with ways to build eclectic teams. So we had something once a week called case call. So we would all bring our cases and you would be shocked at the out or the, the information that came out of those were a totally different perspective. Like I could have a case on the table and you just, sometimes we would get stumped and those are the ones we would typically bring to the table. And, and Mike, you know, you look at it and dissect it and, and you just have a totally different perspective where I, you know, we would constantly, it was almost like a mantra. Wow. I never thought about it that way. I never thought about that, never thought about it that way. So that is where uh, managers, and, and it, it just increases innovation. Again, it's, a, it's an entire science behind it. So you've, you've really picked my interest in the, the difference in the words between diversity and inclusion, yes. because you have suggested they're very different. Yes. And I think most of us think about diversity. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we don't think about so much about inclusion. Can, right. you, can you really help me understand the difference between those two words? Yeah, so great question. So diversity is, once I, I said earlier, that's just the, our differences. That's just, you know, I'm different than, than you, and I'm different, you know, just appreciating the differences. But inclusion, like I said, that's, that's more the verb. That's, that's almost uh, nirvana when everything is kind of coming together and there's a synergy and everything is just working. And to, with relation to companies, that is when your employees are, employees are happy. And it also comes from the C-suite. Let's, let's just kind of really reel it in when you're talking about executives. If the C-suite does not have buy-in and it trickles down, then it's different. I mean, it's going to be difficult. But it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Because everybody knows it's not supported. Yeah. In fact, I lost a potential client. I explained their vulnerabilities, and they, this person got so upset that the person put me out, basically. Like, you know, and I understand. That's like if someone was talking about my son, you know, and this was a CEO of an organization. And, you know, you're protective of, you know, I've nurtured, I've cultivated, I've raised this child, and then you're going to come in here and talk 
talk about yeah. it. So we take it personally. Oh, yeah. But in all reality, in both of those circumstances, there may be a message there that right. if we would not take it so personal and open ourselves up to understanding not just that diversity exists, but this is what I'm learning from you, Nikki. Diversity does exist, exist and that's the recognition that there are things that are different. Yes. Inclusion is understanding how to put those things together. Yes, and increase your bottom line. Because and then if the increase employees productivity. are happy, you know, then it's just infectious. And, you know, you, it was an example. It was a case study done. It was an LGBT company where the CEO was a gay male, and and he just had complete complete buy-in, and his company, I mean, his, his employees, he, he had support. And somehow it got out where well, we're living in the world of, you know, Google land. So it got out about how the whole atmosphere was LGBT friendly and inviting and accommodating and sales skyrocketed. So it, it can affect your brand as well as your numbers, as increase your sales. What you're telling me is that the marketplace actually can respond if you are lacking diversity and inclusion oh, yeah. or whether you're embracing and adopting yeah. one of the two. There's actually a market response is what you're was what you're saying. 100%. And you know, I always say companies who are really vulnerable, for example, like an entire C-suite being white male or um or black female, you know, you're just vulnerable one for potential civil rights complaints, but you're one article away from just ex being exposed. So I'm like, attack it, attack it now. And, um, you know, like I was saying before about it happens if, if from the C-suite. If, if once the executives have buy-in, then it'll ripple down to the managers, which will ripple down to the staff. And of course we're talking an ideal world, right? But it, ha it can happen. It can happen. And like you said, the polar opposite can be disastrous. I mean, it can be a real detriment to your company and your brand. So is your real passion the movement of inclusion or is your real passion to educate people and to embrace inclusion? Oh, gosh. This is music to my ears. Someone who's speaking my language. I love it. I love it. I'd say both. I would definitely say both. Um, how do they two tie together? I mean, how does just, you know, you sending that message, we have to include, mm -hmm. right, which is, a, which is a very powerful message. Mm -hmm. Isn't the training part actually taking that message and putting it into action? Yes, yes. And that's when you hold the managers. Because once I do the training, I don't just drop you. You know, we, we kind of track and determine it, what changes have been made, or I'm always there, I'm a phone call away to, if you have a situation and you, you feel that there's some sort of resistance or pushback or, you know, so I'm there for you to, you know, talk about it. But I feel that, honestly, there's a movement. Let's take the workplace out of it. There's a movement going right here in the city of Detroit. And I think that it's under the the it's kind of cryptic you know old detroiters versus new detroiters which, which is really black talking about black and white so we have the whole gentrification we talk about movement that whole thing going on right now too so. which makes detroit a wonderful place to start learning exactly. about exactly these particular issues exactly right because you can actually immerse yourself mm -hmm. into the understanding and do real life case studies with real companies, real people, real, right? You can actually experience it. Exactly. So get in now, Detroit. get in now, you know, because this is definitely going to be a case study. I remember in high school, um, Dateline 2020 uh, came in because we were the most de facto segregated uh, high school in the United States at that time. And once word got out, I mean, we constantly had people coming in and trying to figure out wh how did this happen and how can, what can we do to improve it? What do you think, Nikki, the one real key characteristic is that has allowed us to become more open to this inclusion movement? The U.S. Census is tracking by the year 2050, there will be no majority race, that the white race will become 49%, uh, and I feel that we're being forced to. So if companies, you know, with this whole globalization and immigration and all the other Asians coming in, you know, it's... You, you're going to be forced to. And, and the thing about what I tell my clients, 
not really, this is more behind the scenes. It's not really into the trainings, but I do talk to management about it. There are civil rights laws that you cannot circumvent. And if you, if a company has over 15 employees, then they are susceptible to civil rights EEOC federal charges, and that's not fun. So one of the things that I am observing, like you are, is society, mm-hmm. we're becoming more melting pot, right? And we are, we're blending together so we don't have one dominant group. But even more importantly, I see a whole emerging understanding that perhaps people aren't even looking yeah. at that issue anymore. That, that, that there's a whole generation of employees coming in who don't even think in terms of what color are you or what gender are you or how tall are you or what color is your hair or what, that I'm okay with you thinking differently than me or behaving differently than me and having different ideals mm-hmm. and actually embracing that instead of repelling that. Am I, am I misreading the you're, environment? You're spot on. You're spot on on two counts. So let me kind of rewind. The, when I was growing up and when you were growing up, we were taught that it's the melting pot, that come to America, it's very inviting, you know, everyone blends together. But what's happening now is they're calling it the salad bowl. I don't know if you've heard of that, where if you look at a salad, you have all the ingredients, where you have the lettuce, you have the croutons, you have the cucumbers, and you put them in this pot, or this bowl, and you even the salad dressing, and all even though they're all mixed together, there's still that individualism going on, the individuality going on. So, um, and I think that's a lot. Some cultures want to preserve that, you know. So yeah, they're in America, and it's beautiful, land of the free. But they still want to preserve their traditions and their music and their food and and all of that. Now to go to the second part of it, I live with a. Now, under the millennials are the Gen Cs, and they're called Gen C because they're what collaborate. Like, they will not move unless it makes sense. If they collaborate, there has to be a mission. So, caring, I have a Gen C, and he's even like, why were people talking about slavery or something? It happened so long ago. And, 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 you know, and I've heard other millennials and Gen Cs say, Let's just move forward. Who cares about that? And so my son just went to the U of M Summer Youth Dialogues, and so all summer long they were talking about discrimination and race and segregation. And those kids came out, they had a great graduation Saturday, and they said going forward it's not going to be racism that's the differentiator. It's going to be socioeconomic. So when they said that, I'm like, wow. I mean, here I am, you know, kind of, I'm the Generation X you know, right under the baby boomers, so we think alike, but to hear them say, forget about race, who's going to care? That's going to be irrelevant. It's separating now between the haves and the have-nots. So, when he, yeah, so I said, oh, God, I have to incorporate that in my diversity training, right, learning from out of the mouths of babes, right? Well, here's what, here's what I, I guess, Nikki, I'd like for you to bring this kind of all together and kind of give us your kind of your guiding thoughts on, so what does this mean for an individual who's listening to these podcasts and really wants to succeed as a leader and wants to su- succeed as a, as a successful executive? I say, again, break up the group think, and it's so easier said than done because, again, it is human nature to surround yourself with, and make your village, and, and especially your advisors, like-minded people. But you got to break it up, and you would be shocked at the innovation and the creativity that comes out of that. So um, that, that's my key. That, that would be my number one. And the second thing is, just as a warning, just be compliant with civil rights laws. And I, I always have to put on my civil rights hat um, because you don't want any kind of disaster to come to you. Mickey, way. how do people get a hold of you at Global Alliance Solutions? Well, I can be reached um, via email at N-I-K-K-I at globesoul.com. So it's Nikki at G-L-O-B-E-S-O-L.com. Or my telephone number is to the office is 313-645-7107. And if I'm away from the office, then just leave a message. Thank you, Nikki. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Julie, so many things to talk about, but the one thing that has really struck me that I hope we spend some time with is diversity and inclusion. 
Yes, I loved the fact that she distinguished for us that diversity is a noun and inclusion as a verb. And I think this is something that all good leaders could spend a little time thinking about and could use to their advantage. Diversity means you have many different points of view. She talked about in our culture, we tend to focus on race, but it is very layered and it's very complicated. And that if you understand the differences between people or between sort of organizations or situations, that you can then grow from that and use that knowledge to come up with better solutions to what needs to be accomplished. And then inclusion is the verb of bringing th people together and crafting solutions that use all those perspectives. Um, so that it's uh, that sort of getting past your, it, within your internal group think and getting into a bigger, broader um, set of thinking that's not just about your single point of view. So Julie, if diversity is the noun, just the description of what uh, different things are, how does a leader begin to look at the role of inclusion as a behavioral asset to the strength of a business? We've all seen examples where the phrase, let's get the right people around the table yes. is used. But that's just bringing the right people around the table and not using them to really craft where your organization or your company needs to go next. And inclusion is that richer discussion and using the perspectives of having those people around the table to alter your thinking about what you can accomplish, what you need to do, or what your mission is for who you're trying to serve. Because that is about doing something for the broadest group of people. It's not just understanding who they are. So let's take that to the next level, Julie. If we have individuals sitting around the table with us who may have different perspectives because of their diversity, how do we as leaders start to pull them in and include those characteristics into part of our leadership initiatives? that we're going to take outbound into the marketplace? How do we use that to our advantage? I think it's having that interactive conversation, not just learning who they are, but what they need, and talking to them about how you might be able to offer them what they need. It's not your deciding what they need and delivering it to them. It's your asking them and then talking to them about what might happen next and how that might serve uh, what they what they would benefit from. That is a way of uh, sort of a serv service mission to an organization rather than a sort of solution offering mission. It's thinking about it differently as serving a population, not just inserting a product or a, a way of approaching something that you have, but actually figuring out how to connect what you can do with what will help them. So what you're beginning to suggest is instead of a leader dismissing an idea that's different, a leader needs to learn to be curious about how that different thought process has the opportunity to connect in a different way to create more value in the marketplace and give you the, your company the competitive advantages needs. Right. What, whatever is next in your area of work, it's going to come from people that aren't thinking like you're already thinking. It's disrupting your own business in advance to evolve and connecting yourself intentionally to people that don't think like you think now because they might become your customers or your members or your community because you've reached out and understood their needs as opposed to just serving the group that you've always traditionally thought of as the population that you serve. So Julie, what is the opportunity for a, a leader to bring uh, diverse thought into their conversation internally to help discover some external opportunities that they didn't know even existed yet. I think it's inviting people that you don't know now. It's reaching out to people that aren't like you. It's talking to people that aren't in your industry. That's where some of the learning occurs. Um, Nikki talks about the fact that um, inclusion and diversity and being aware and intentional about those things also will leverage your own workforce, your employees. They will be more enthusiastic. They will come with more ideas. They will make more connections. Um, and also leveraging your brand. It's not just the right thing to do. It will also benefit what you can be and what you can offer and how you might evolve to survive into the future. Julie, you've actually, by example, done some of this. Nikki had suggested that Detroit is a place where we can start to learn about inclusion 
and you actually had taken your staff into Detroit to learn uh, through some case studies, some reinvention that's going on, some some diverse and and different thinking. How did an opportunity like that, by actually immersing a group into a more diverse experience, really start to bring home what Nikki's message was? I think some of the messages that you need to hear in your own circumstance are best heard from someone in a completely different circumstance. I mean, for one, you see people that have taken on tough challenges and figured out a way to get around those challenges. And part of it is persistence, part of it is hard work, but part of it is also inviting the broadest group of people together to try to solve the problem. There are many stories like that in Detroit now. Um, So it's not just tenacity, it's having the right connection and the right kind of problem solving skill set from the biggest group possible. And Nikki talks about Detroit being a case study in, in the future in inclusion and a way to actually solve problems that people thought couldn't be solved in her work in trying to prevent problems in advance by using those opportunities and using that learning and having that broader conversation to leverage any problem solving that you need to do. We've had great success taking groups into Detroit and by example listening and learning how they've been able to use diversity and inclusion in order to solve some of their most serious problems. And uh, thank you very much for recognizing, Julie, how important a field trip like that is. And remember, if you're ready for a change, make it a change that lasts. Make it Pure Reinvention. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.